Well, I want to welcome each of you to Cross Community Church today. Uh, whether you're here in person or you're watching online or at our Pecola campus, we're just delighted that we have an opportunity to gather and to worship Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. He is the reason uh, that we do everything that we do. Now, today we have the unique privilege of beginning a new series. I'm going to be honest, this one's going to be a little bit lengthy, but we are going to begin walking through the New Testament book of uh, Philippians. This is Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Now, one of the reasons that this letter uh, is excellent, that I, I love this letter, is that it really kind of encompasses, uh, we get a portrait of both the birth of the church and then the later growth of this church. So uh, if you were to go back in your Bibles and look in Acts chapter 16, you're going to see the whole context, the whole beginning of the church at Philippi. So as we begin today, I'm going to, as quickly as I possibly can, uh, run through all of Acts chapter 16 to kind of tell you what's going on there. Uh, if you want to try to follow along, we're going to begin about verse 9 and make it all the way through the end of the chapter. But I'm going to be honest, I tried as hard as I could to pack this into about 35 minutes, and there was no chance if I read all of Acts 16. So I'm going to paraphrase as much as I can, but just kind of give you the highlights of how this church came into being. You see the birth of new believers happening in the city of Philippi. And so here's how that came to pass. Paul was on one of his missionary journeys. He was going about sharing the gospel to the Gentiles as he did. And, and one evening as he, as he sat there, he saw a vision. And it was a vision of a man from Macedonia. And he was pleading with Paul. And he was saying, we need someone to help. The man of vision was saying, Paul, we need someone to come and share the gospel in our city. The gospel had never been heard in Philippi as far as we know. There was no hope. It was a place of darkness. People were worshiping false gods. They were just getting by the best that they could. And in a vision, a man from Macedonia pleads with Paul, would you come and help us? And Paul, recognizing that this is indeed a vision from the Lord, he's like, we're going to Macedonia. Now, Philippi happened to be one of the leading cities of the district of Macedonia. And so Paul, he set sail. He winds up there in Philippi. And here, here's the, the, the thing. There was no even Jewish synagogue in that city. They were a Roman colony. They were worshiping all the kind of Roman gods that you may have heard of when you were younger. There weren't even good Jews in the city or not very many. And so rather than teaching in the synagogues as Paul would often do when he went to new cities, he goes out by a river and he finds some women there. It was known as a place of prayer. And he begins to share the gospel with them, the truth of the gospel. Now these women were known as God worshipers. Um, what they likely were, were Gentile converts to Judaism. And as Paul preached the gospel on that day, the scriptures tell us that God opened the heart of one of the women there in the hearing of Paul that day, and she became a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, she was uh, uh, an ordinary businesswoman, probably fairly successful. It's likely that she was wealthy. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira. And immediately upon receiving the gospel, she took it to her entire household. The scriptures tell us that every one of them came to faith, that they were ultimately baptized on that day. And her first response to receiving the gospel was, hey, how do I get involved? What do I need to do to make sure this continues? And so she invites Paul, the Apostle Paul and his companions, to stay in her home. She would have provided lodging and food and the care that they would have needed uh, while they were doing their gospel ministry in that city. Now, Paul continued doing what he had done when he preached the gospel to Lydia. He would go out by the river to this place of prayer and proclaim the gospel. But something really interesting started happening in the city of Philippi. There was a slave girl there. Uh, who was actually possessed by a demon that enabled her to tell fortunes. Neat trick, if you will. And her masters were making a lot of money from her doing this. On, on, on behalf of people, they would come and pay, and she would tell their fortunes, and they're getting rich. But on, uh, when Paul and his associates began to proclaim the gospel outside the city, she started following them around saying, these men are bond servants of the Most High God, and they were proclaiming to you the way of salvation. And so day after day, she would follow Paul around, yelling these things. And apparently, the scriptures tell us that Paul got so annoyed that he turned around and he rebuked the demon, and it left her. Now, the problem with that behavior, normally you would think if you like, set someone free from being demon-possessed, uh, we would be glad about that. But the problem was that that caused her masters to lose their source of income. She couldn't tell fortunes anymore. 
And so they got angry with Paul, and they, they kind of stirred up the crowd against him. They brought him before the magistrates and said, these men are stirring up our city. We're a Roman colony. They're Jews. And they had Paul and Silas beaten with rods. The scriptures tell us that there were many blows with which these men were beaten and struck with these rods, that they were thrown into the innermost part of the prison. And there, even in prison, Paul and Silas, they began to pray and sing hymns there. And in the, and in the middle of the night, there was an earthquake. And this wasn't an ordinary earthquake. This was one from God himself. An earthquake which opened the doors of the prison, which freed them from their shackles. The jailer, seeing the doors of the prison open, figuring the prisoners had escaped, he's about to kill himself when Paul cries out and says, Hey, don't kill yourself. We're still here. The man rushes in and he falls on his knees. He says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And there in the middle of that prison, Paul shares the gospel with a jailer who God opens his heart to it as well. He ends up caring for the wounds of Paul and Silas, cleaning up where they've been beaten. He invites them into his home and he shares the meal. And that day, the entire household of the, of the jailer in Philippi also came to faith in Jesus Christ. Now the next day, the authorities there in Philippi, they discover that Paul was a Roman citizen, and they were like, hey, we're really sorry for putting you in prison and beating you. Um, will you just leave the city? And Paul left the city. It was just a number of days that he was there. But there's something unique about this letter to the Philippians that Paul writes from prison. Um, everybody who studies this letter concludes that there's a, an unusual enthusiasm, an unusual love, that this letter is more personal in nature than most every other letter that Paul wrote to the churches. What we find here is not the strong rebukes for maybe some of the things the churches had done wrong, but instead in this letter it's just kind of gentle correction. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to begin with me in Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Look at the familiarity that with which Paul writes to them. It says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus. I can't help but think this was a bit of an inside joke for the people who were there as that slave girl followed him around shouting, these men are bond servants of the Most High God, proclaiming the way of salvation to you. And so Paul, it's like he's writing to his friends, his beloved associates. He's like, Paul and Timothy, the bond servants of that Most High God. Y'all remember us? We're friends, right? Like there is this, this cordiality, this love that Paul has for the people. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus. Now hear this. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. Now, when Paul left that city, as far as we know from the scriptures, there were two households who understood the gospel. Lydia, who had converted to Judaism and just came to faith in Christ, and the household of the Philippian jailer. That's it. Paul leaves the city, and yet when he writes to them the next time, apparently they'd had some level of correspondence. Maybe they'd uh, had people travel between Paul and Philippi. But on this day, he's not writing to two households, the Philippian jailer and Lydia. Instead, he's writing to all of the saints in Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. What we see here is that a church has been born. It's not just a couple of households anymore. As a matter of fact, we have multiple elders present here in this church. We have multiple deacons now present. We have all the saints across Philippi. The church had grown. It had been, it had been birthed and it had taken root in the city of Philippi. And the city was being transformed by the believers who were there. And he, he opens with a customary greeting. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he does something really unusual for Paul. Paul was a, a well-educated man. He was trained under Gamaliel, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, trained in rhetoric. And he gets a little bit giddy at this point in his letter. He, he kind of overdoes it a little bit with his, his use of, of words. It's kind of like this... Uh, uh, overemphasis, or again, there's like this uh, exuberance with which Paul writes. He uses the word all or every four different times to describe his affection for the Philippian believers. Look what he says here in verse 3. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, 
always offering prayer with joy in every prayer for you all. I mean, he's just like, man, you people are the greatest. Like, I have such fond memories. Every time I think of you, every time I pray for you, I'm overwhelmed with all joy for every single person who is in your congregation. Like, Paul has this unusual affection for the church there at Philippi. And he just wants them to know, like, man, I'm so excited about what God is doing. I'm so filled with gratitude and joy about what is happening in the church at at Philippi. And then he tells them why. In verse 5, I'm thankful in every remembrance. I'm always offering prayer with joy in every prayer for every one of you in view of, when I'm reminded of, when I think about, verse 5, your participation in the gospel from your first day until now. See, the, the thing that made Philippi so unique among the churches where Paul would travel and visit was um, they were not just recipients of the gospel. They didn't just hear the gospel and think, man, what an extraordinary gift that God has given to me. I was a sinful person who was hopeless and unable to save myself. I know my sin had separated me from God. Um, they, they didn't just receive the gospel and be like, hey, I've now been set free because of the work of Jesus on the cross. Instead, they weren't merely recipients of the gospel. They became participants in the gospel, which means that it wasn't like, um, I often talk about American Christianity. Uh, I might even call it Southern American Christianity, where most people, when I talk to them about their faith, you go visit with people out in our city or you know, at lunch or wherever, and you ask them, hey, tell me about your faith in Christ. They're going to point you back to a moment at which their lives intersected with Jesus. Hey, I was seven years old, and I went to a vacation Bible school, and I, I prayed a prayer right then, and I got saved. And then you ask them, okay, so what's that look like recently? Well, uh, you know, I, I haven't been in church a lot, and I haven't been reading my Bible, and, you know, I'm kind of away from the Lord right now. But I, I, when I was seven, my life intersected with Jesus, and so I'm good. I'm, I'm saved. Or, or maybe your story it would be you were a bit older, uh, had kids, got back in church, started following Jesus. But if you were honest about where you are right now, you're too pointing back to the time when your life intersected with Jesus. Like, oh yeah, we crossed paths back then. I trusted in him. And so, yeah, I'm a believer. Did you know that Lydia in the city of Philippi would have thought she was on the right path? She was out at a place of prayer. The scriptures say she was a God worshiper, but she'd never truly received the gospel of Jesus Christ. She'd never become a disciple of Jesus. See, when the scriptures teach us about uh, Jesus Christ and how we relate to him, about how the gospel should shape us, it doesn't teach us primarily about an intersection where we cross paths with him and we believed he was indeed the Messiah. Matter of fact, Jesus is like, hey, demons believe that I'm the Messiah. They tremble. But demons have never been obedient to Jesus Christ. They've never submitted their lives to him. Rather than thinking about our relationship with Jesus and our salvation experience in terms of this time where our paths intersected with Jesus, what we ought to see as believers in him is the time where we began to follow him. Where we were going one way, Jesus was going another, we forsook our old way and we began to follow after Jesus Christ. The reason Paul is so excited about what's happening in the city of Philippi is that they were participants in the gospel. From the very first day until the day that he wrote the letter, they had been participants in the gospel. It was Lydia. She came to faith and she was like, hey, what do I have? How do I support this work? How do I support this mission? She invites Paul and his associates to, to live in her home, to stay there, providing for their needs. The Philippian jailer, in one moment he's on his knees. What must I do to be saved? And the next moment, he begins to care for the wounds of Paul and Silas. Feeds him a meal in his home. And he brings his household near. Hey, would you tell them what you told me? Paul and Silas, they share the gospel. Their whole households come to faith in Jesus Christ. And apparently, that had continued. Sure, it happened while Paul was there. But even when Paul had left, they continued to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to invest treasure into his kingdom, to love people, to serve people, to care for people. They were participants in the gospel. 
rather than mere recipients of it. Their lives didn't just intersect with Jesus at some point that they could be like, oh yeah, February 3rd, 1987, uh, my life intersected with Jesus. But instead, like that's the day that I began to follow him, and I'm still following him to this day. Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. If you're following after Jesus Christ, you should be too. Seeking after the ones which are lost. You ought to be living your life on mission, participating in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like, so what we would say is that faith in Christ isn't something that we just kind of add to our lives. Like wear around like a badge on our shirt or something we put in our pocket. Like, oh, I'm saved. Like I got this thing. I've received the gospel. But instead, the gospel is the lens through which we begin to see the entire world. That I have been saved by Jesus. I've now been given this ministry of reconciliation. And my life is now given not to seeking the kingdom of this world, but instead to seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That I might walk in him and be uh, found fullness and joy and hope in him. And then I want to share that with the world that is around. Paul addresses the Philippians in verse 2, or in verse 1, he says, To all the saints who are in Philippi. Now, let's be honest. The people at Philippi were just like you and me. They were men and women who, in the weakness of their flesh, they struggled sometimes. They would have stumbled with sin. They would have got caught up in things. They would have said things they weren't supposed to say, done things they weren't supposed to do. And yet Paul addresses them as saints. The Greek word is hagios. It means holy ones. And he writes to the holy ones who are in Philippi, not necessarily on the basis of what they've done, but on the basis of what Jesus Christ had done for them. You know the gospel, it's the great exchange where Jesus took all of our sin. He bore our sin and our shame on the cross. And what was credited to us, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us that God made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of Christ in him. The great exchange, he took our sin and gave to us his righteousness. So Paul writes to these saints who are in Philippi saying, hey, here's who you are in Jesus. Your sins have been washed away. You're now made righteous in him. You're saints. But then look what he says here in verse 6. To those who were already the holy ones, those who were saints, he says, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. The normal expectation for you as a follower of Jesus, a believer in Jesus Christ, is that you will be continually transformed. Like every day of your life, you're being transformed by the gospel. The God who began a good work in you is going to continue that work in you, transforming your heart, transforming your life, that you won't just be a saint because of the work of Jesus, but you'll begin to live out this righteous life in him. That you won't just be a recipient of the gospel, but instead you like dig in and you become a participant in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's what Lydia did. It's what the Philippian jailer did. And the gospel exploded across that city, which was completely pagan until Paul preached. Men and women came to faith in him. The city was transformed. Y'all, that's our hope for our city too. It's my prayer for your, your relatives who don't know Jesus Christ. It's my prayer for your coworkers. It's my prayer for people we don't even know their names yet. That because there are believers in Jesus Christ in this city, because we're not merely recipients of the gospel, because we're participants in, that we will leave this place today and we will go out and begin to share the gospel, live the gospel, love people as Jesus loved them, and we go make a difference in our culture, in our city, in your home, in your neighborhood, in your place of work, and in your school. You've seen our, our billboard out on uh, 112 out here. It says one church, two campuses, hundreds of locations. To be honest with you, I do not think for an instant that the most significant spiritual work that happens in this church happens here on a Sunday morning when we gather. Like, I hope that you're encouraged here. I hope that as we gather and we worship, that your hearts are uplifted and you're you know, challenged to go and follow Jesus more. I hope that the word uh, works in your heart and you're, you're repenting of sin and, and like recommitting yourself to follow after Jesus. But you know where the most significant spiritual work happens in this church? 
Not here on Sunday morning, but it happens when we leave here and we scatter out all across Poto and Pecola and Cameron and how and wherever it is that you may live and we take the gospel with us. Do you know why the church grew at Philippi? It's not because the Apostle Paul spent a great deal of time there. It's because the believers there they weren't just participants, or they weren't just uh, recipients of the gospel. They were participants in it. And y'all, that's our challenge as the people of God, 2,000 years later, reading the words of Paul to the church at Philippi. We are going to be participants in the gospel. For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. Paul's like, I'm not the minister of the gospel. I'm not just like the apostle who has all this power and all this gifting, and so I come into your city and I do all the work, and then you guys just kind of live. He's like, man, I'm so confident that God's going to continue to work in you because I've already seen it happening. And you were with me when I was in prison. You've been with me in the defense and in the confirmation of the gospel. You are the church who is doing the work of Jesus Christ in your city. And Paul is overjoyed, not because of his circumstances. He's writing from prison. Paul is overjoyed because the gospel is going forth in the city, even in his absence. If you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, can I ask you this question? If all of this went away, there's no... Screens and lights and sound system. There's no building, no elders, no deacons. But it's you and your household. In the city of Poto, or Pecola, or Cameron, or wherever you may live. If it was you and your household, would the gospel still be proclaimed? Would Paul still be able to write you a letter? In every remembrance, just being grateful for you. Joyful in every prayer. For the work of you all, because he, he sees your participation in the gospel. In your relationship with Jesus, are you looking back to a time where your life intersected him? Okay, yeah, we crossed paths one day. Or can you look ahead and see that you're following him? That your heart's being transformed to look more like his heart. And your desires more like the desires of Christ. Your life is being conformed to the life of Jesus. Are you a participant in the gospel? Or to put it a little more bluntly, are you just kind of a spectator? Show up once a week, listen to a message, done my duty, and going home. The intention for the gospel was that it would become the forefront of our lives. It would become our mission. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works. We believe this with all of our hearts, that no detail of your life is by accident. We believe that you were born when you were born, into the family that you were born into, given the gifts and abilities and talents that you have. You find yourself in the workplace that you work at or the school that you attend. We believe that God intended all of that on purpose. See, Lydia, she wasn't just a seller of purple. She was a missionary of Jesus Christ in the city of Philippi. The jailer... He wasn't just a jailer. And he was a missionary of Jesus Christ to some of the roughest people who would have come through that city. A witness to the gospel right where he was. Verse 8, Paul goes on. He says, For God is my witness how I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. So the question you might have is, how, how do I become a participant in the gospel? Like, how do I move from a place where I show up at church and I, I, I listen and maybe, you know, participate a little, but I mean, move from a place where I'm, I'm a, a spectator, a recipient of the gospel to someone who is a participant? Number one, it begins with believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
I'm under no illusion that everyone in this room today, everyone who's watching online or at our Pecola campus, um, knows Jesus Christ. Some of you may be here very intentionally just trying to find out, like, uh, what does it look like to be a disciple? Who is Jesus? What is this whole Christianity thing? If you're here today and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, you've never come to a place where you've placed your faith and trust in Him, the first step for you is just to believe the gospel, to recognize that you are indeed a sinner. And your sin has separated you from God. Romans 3 tells us that the wages of sin is death. Which is pretty sobering. But then I want to remind you, the gospel tells us that Jesus died in your place. To set you free from sin and death. And to empower you to now live in fullness of life. Living out the gospel. The abundant life that Jesus has for you. So if you're here today... You've never trusted in Jesus Christ. In just a couple of minutes, we're going to have a time of invitation, a time of response. And I don't want you to delay. I don't want you to wait. I'm going to meet you right down here front, and I want to share with you about what it means to follow Jesus. If you're here today and you're a believer, you're saying, okay, I've been in church, and I kind of know the steps. I know the paces of going to church. I know the words they're going to use. I recognize some of the names of the, the books of the Bible. I could, you know, maybe do okay in Bible trivia. But to be honest with you, I've never been a participant in the gospel. The second thing, I want to challenge you today to invest what you have. You know, Lydia, she was not a scholar in the person work of Jesus right after Paul shared the gospel with her, right? She didn't know the ins and outs of the Bible. She wouldn't have been like the most articulate person. But she was a seller of purple who had made some money. She had some things. She's like, hey, I I don't necessarily know all that you know, Paul. I'm a brand new believer, but I want to offer you what you have. I have have a home. Would you come and live here? Would you come and stay here? Man, I want you to do your work out of my house. I'll feed you. I'll care for you. Just begin to invest what you have. The, The jailer, he just hit his knees like, what do I need to do to be saved? He didn't know all the answers. But he cared for their wounds. He fed them a meal. He invited his friends to come and hear from Paul and Silas what it meant to follow Jesus. And they just kept doing that. They learned more. They invested more. Apparently the jailer came to understand the gospel. The the people of God, they grew in that city because someone was sharing the gospel in that city. And so you invest what you have. And as God gives you more, you invest that too. Maybe you feel like, uh, hey, I'm just a Lydia. I'm just a business person. I don't want to stand on stage and preach. I'm probably not going to be the guy that yells on the street corner. Here's what I would say. Maybe you are just a Lydia, but the church in Philippi began with just such a woman. Maybe you're just an ordinary business person. And I would just say, don't let your assets sit on the sidelines. Instead, invest them into the kingdom of God. The jailer wouldn't have been a man of a lot of means, but he was a man of a lot of opportunity. And apparently he took the gospel to the jail with him and he began to share the gospel right where he was. You may feel like, hey, I'm just an ordinary jailer. I don't have a lot of money. I don't stand up on stage and, and speak. But here's the thing. The church began in Philippi because of just such a man, because of just such a woman, ordinary believers who chose to participate in the gospel by investing what they have. I don't know what your gifts are. I don't know what your bank account looks like. I don't know a whole lot of things about any of you in particular. But I do know that God has given us everything we need to be the church of Jesus Christ in our city. To represent the gospel well here. To see a harvest of souls, men and women who desperately need to come to faith in Christ. Believe the gospel and invest what you have. Whatever that is. Seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Believing that all the other things God is going to provide for you. The third thing. It's just grow what you got. It sounds kind of odd to frame it that way, but look what Paul said in in verse 10. He says, in this I pray that your love, which they obviously had some love, right? He says this, I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. And the Philippians had love, and they they were killing it. They were doing good things in their city. The gospel was going forth. They were participants. He's like, I pray that your love, what you have, And just continue to grow. Your love for God and your love for other people may abound still more and more in real knowledge and depth of insight. In verse 11, he talks about being filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ. Our our strategy here, 
our mission as a church is to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus. You know what our strategy is? Have them do the things that disciples did. We're going to proclaim the gospel from the stage. We're going to challenge you guys to go out and do that. And then there are six practices that we point everyone to. Devoting yourself daily. Just getting in the Word. This is how we grow our love for God and other people. We devote daily, spending time in the Word and in prayer. We gather here consistently to be reminded and encouraged by the body. We commit ourselves to community. We do life deeply with people. These are the people that we lock arms with and say, we're going to chase after Jesus. Don't let me fall down. Don't let me give up. Don't let me fall away. You run with me toward Jesus Christ, and we're going to do it together. We tell people to serve faithfully. Every one of you has been given a gift that was given for the building up of the body. If you're not serving here, something's wrong. Now, there are seasons you get, you get sick, and there are times where you're hurting, you need to be ministered to. But in all the other seasons, you should be serving the body of Jesus Christ, using your gifts on behalf of this church. The fifth thing that we ask people to do is to give sacrificially. There is not a better use of your money, your time, your treasure, than investing it into the kingdom of God. Everything else in this life is, is temporal. I recognize that I just bought my kids a bunch of presents that they won't care about next year, right? But the money that we send into the kingdom of God, and it continues to produce a return. Philippi was the first place in Europe where the gospel took root. We just did a series about uh, the, the, the five solos of the Protestant Reformation and all that. You know where that started? In Philippi. The lady named Lydia opened her home so that Paul could continue to preach in the gospel. The treasure we invest in the kingdom of God will produce a return forever. The sixth thing is we challenge you to engage missionally. That means when you leave this place, you represent Jesus Christ well. You love people as Jesus loved people. You serve them, you care for them, and you articulate the gospel to them. The challenge I gave you last week it's my hope and my prayer that every single person in this church, every single member of this body, just saying to God, would you, would you allow me to lead one person to you this year? Just one person, God. I mean, obviously, we would love more than that. We, we pray for more than that. Like, we want to see many hundreds and thousands come to faith. But our prayer this year is that God would use you and God would use me just to lead at least one person to faith in Christ. You know what happens when that happens? When we engage missionally, we have to redo the billboard, right? Because we're not one church with a couple of campuses and hundreds of locations, but we're one church, two campuses, and thousands of locations. And the gospel takes root here. Light begins to shine in the darkness, and our cities, our schools, our places of business are transformed. So today I want to encourage you, believe the gospel, invest what you have, and grow what you got. Let me pray for you. Father, we are truly thankful, Lord, that you were the original missionary, that you stepped down out of heaven and you came. You took on flesh, that you offered yourself as a sacrifice for us, that we might find life. You laid down our lives that we might find them in you. Lord, I pray that we would be a people who imitate that. We lay down our lives that others might find it in you. Lord, for the person here who doesn't know you, I pray that today would be the day of salvation, that just as you open the heart of Lydia and the jailer in Philippi, that today you would open their hearts and they might trust in you, believe in you. For those who have their treasure and their talent sitting on the sideline, they're in the stands watching instead of playing the game, I pray that today would be the day they begin to invest what they have. Just offering it to you, saying, God, I don't know a lot, I don't have all the answers, but I'm going to give you what I have. And Lord, I pray that you would take it and multiply it across our city. And Lord, I pray for every single one of us in this room that you would continue to grow us in our love for you and other people. And we pray this in the powerful and the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.